Yes, sir, good to see you, Joe Phillips. I about on a uh, Got Kennedy Baptist Hospital in War 24A. Just flat fix and bring you the hottest thing in the country, real hot and blue. Coming to you through WHBQ in Memphis, Tennessee, and it's Friday night. Tomorrow's payday and bath day. That's a good deal. Yes, sir, the first 15 minutes of real hot and blue is coming to you through the courtesy of the best beer that money can buy. We're talking about CV for me and CV for you. That champagne velvet distributed by the mass security company right here in the city of Memphis. Now, don't forget, by now, let's just flat wake up out there. Let's get ready. We're going to start off the first record here. Let's see now. Wait a minute here. That's the voice of Dewey Phillips, hosting his radio show called Red Hot and Blue on WHBQ, a Memphis station. In the 1950s, more than 100,000 people listened to his primetime slot every day. If you couldn't make out what Dewey was saying, don't feel bad. I had to listen to it a few times myself. But for Memphians of that era, Dewey's frantic and crazed cadence was just part of the experience. Dewey was a very popular radio DJ here in Memphis. He'd survived one of the worst battles of World War II, and he came back with an amphetamine addiction and an alcoholic and severe PTSD from this battle and was another very eccentric Memphis character, as so many people that are on these walls were. That's the voice of Crockett Hall, a tour guide and audio engineer at Sun Studio in Memphis. I visited Sun Studio recently. Crockett and another tour guide, Zoe Duran, told me of stories about this building and its place in music history. Sun Studio was founded in 1950 by Sam Phillips, who is not related to Dewey, by the way, and Marion Keisker. It was the recording home of Elvis Presley, Jerry Lee Lewis, and Johnny Cash, among others. Though Dewey never worked for Sun Studios, he was a relentless promoter of Sun Studio musicians. His energy and electric personality made him an icon in his field, in spite of the fact that he wasn't a trained radio DJ, nor did he have a degree in broadcasting or communication. Dewey would go into a store called Pop Tunes and he would sit where they had these record players that you could test your record out and there was a microphone to call for assistance and he would play these records and then he would loudly just yell into the mic about which songs he liked and which ones he thought were trash. One day an ad guy walks in for WDIA and he says to he says to Dewey, I think I, I have a show for you and he gets him 15 minutes and a show called Red Hot and Blue and Dewey would have noisemakers in the studio, he would play two records at the same exact time of the same song, but they're playing wrong, so they're out of phase, and that's just broadcasting over the airwaves. He, he was the man of almost a thousand voices. He's just constantly having an inner dialogue with himself, likely because of the amphetamines that he's on. And, and he was just a really incredible, also warm-hearted person. Dewey is the first person to ever play an Elvis song on the radio. He had a good relationship with Sam Phillips, and Sam brought him a copy of Elvis, singing My Happiness. That night, Dewey played that song over and over again. The biggest impact Dewey made, though, was connecting black musicians with Sun. Dewey is the missing link between why Sam was able to bring in a lot of the black musicians he was able to. At that moment in time, Beale Street was considered the black capital of the South. It was not a place like it is today where it's largely a tourist destination. And you see people down there that are still play, playing their craft and playing incredible blues music, but it's a little bit different sort of a vibe than it would have been in the 50s. It wasn't a place that white people went and hung out. Dewey was one of the few white people who would walk up and down Beale Street and go into these bars and see these bands. Sam knew and understood, given the time period, that if he wanted to record these artists, he, he needed an end so that they knew they were walking into a safe space where they could also do their recording. So he, before he opens the studio, or right around that same time, meets with Dewey in the lobby bar of the Peabody Hotel and expresses to him that he'd like to start recording these blues artists that Dewey's playing on his show and that he wants Dewey to help him with playing it on the airwaves, as well as also, if you've got bands you want to send my way, I'm open to record them. Sam was inspired by another recording studio in Memphis called Stax Records. Stax was an integrated studio that mainly produced soul and blues music. Otis Redding, the massively successful black soul artist, was a Stax musician. You also 
end up getting to see in places like Stack sort of the vision that Sam originally had for a place like this, where mm -hmm. now it's not a roster of white artists playing together and then black artists playing together, but you see the integration that they had over there with the bands like the Marquis mm -hmm. uh, and a number of the session players, Steve Cropper, who's a an incredible guitarist that was playing on the on those records that and are he being also... written by Isaac Hayes and David Porter. With Dewey's help, several black musicians got their start at Sun. These people, in a way, kind of laid the foundation for that because they they provided the the foot in the door when there wasn't during segregation in regards to recording and putting mm -hmm. music out on the radio. Because back then, radio was everything. Yeah. Everybody had access to the radio. Only wealthy people had access to TVs at that time. So when you think of radio, that was our Instagram, our Twitter, our Facebook, our news on the TV. Our podcast. It, yeah, it was everything. So radio was so important at that time. So what they did really did kind of lay the foundation and kind of get people's foot in the door for things like y'all further learned about today with the 60s. They laid the foundation for the 60s to happen here in yeah. terms of like the civil well, rights the, movement and the rest and of the country it. in many ways mm -hmm. too. I mean, that's happening in other places as well, of course. Oh yeah, because I mean, you think Roscoe Gordon Jr. Mm -hmm. He recorded here. He's one of the founding godfathers of reggae and ska music. They would play his music on the radio in New Orleans. And when the weather was just right, those airwaves would reach Jamaica. And he inspired the Whalers, Lee Scratch Perry, Bob Marley. Imagine a world without those people. Yeah, Roscoe is another very interesting character. He had a pet rooster, Butch, that he would take with him. And as the show finale, he would set a cup of whiskey that Butch would drink out of. And he wouldn't end the show until Butch fell over drunk. <laughs> and you said that he recorded here as well? He did. He did. He's photographed with Sam right over there in that corner. That's, that's Roscoe, And that's, Roos, Roos, that's, and that's Butch, Butch the rooster. <laughs> of which there were probably several, I would imagine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sam's very first hit that he got, too, that was with Rufus Thomas. That really... Which Joe Hill Lewis is playing guitar mm -hmm. on. Bearcat, which was an answer to Big Mama Thornton's Hound Dog. And Rufus didn't want to sing it. He said to Sam, what's a Bearcat? That's not what this says isn't anything. But if Sam wrote the song, he got co-songwriter credit. Rufus is also an interesting character. He's one of the, one of the few people you hear with a negative uh, attitude towards Sam. He was very candid. He would come here he's, and, and near the latter part of his life, he's known as the mayor of Beale Street, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. And he was also called the world's oldest teenager, Rufus Thomas was. But he, he was critical of Sam. He felt as though after Sam made it big with Elvis, that he neglected to focus on the blues artist that he had really made his way with. And it's a fairly justifiable criticism if you look at where his money was being spent, but he did continue to record these blues artists. I don't think he understood in his own way how to market them. He would, of course, Bobby Blue Bland also was recording here. Pat Hare. Pat Hare. Uh, little Walter Horton. Little Junior Parker. Mm -hmm. Also Memphis Ma Rainey recorded here too. Big Memphis Ma Rainey. Yeah, yeah. Big Memphis Ma Rainey. And a lot of people don't realize either. Sam only signed one woman to any label at all. And it was Barbara Pittman. That's She's right. right behind you. And he actually gave her the option of whether or not she wanted to sign with the Sun Record Company or Sam Phillips International. Because that was his new label that he had started up when he was kind of moving yeah. out of here. But Big Memphis Ma Rainey he had actually paid and promoted her the second most out of any woman in the studio. He just never signed her to a label. There's so a, that's a fun fact. There's a really strange story surrounding that photograph. When I first started working here, there were no photos of any of the women who had recorded here, which there are not many that you would really know. So I, I understand why, but it seemed important to make sure that she's a, one of my favorite artists that cut here. I don't think we should just be focusing on the big picture guys, but also it's really important to know like, Barbara was a childhood friend of Elvis's. She would often come up here and hang out with him once he'd been signed to the label before she was signed. There's also a great story of when the place reopened, the owners reaching out and saying, hey, if you have anything to send us, please, uh, Please send us any sort of memorabilia. We'll display it for you. And Barbara sent a box of junk that included a pair of her panties, her granny panties, which is which is funny. Where are they? Oh, I don't know. I was like, why are they not hanging in the cafe? That'd be hilarious to just like, I know. Yeah. But Barbara, when I got that picture to put up in here, my friend Clara went to pick it up and she hands me my change and she looks at me really, not disturbed, but kind of bewildered and says the change was 7.06. I was like, cool, thanks. And she says, no. 
the chain was 706 and I, I still am not getting it. She's like, the address of the studio is 706. And I was like, well, that's kind of strange. And then I, I go to Hernando's Hideaway, which is a, a bar that opened here a few years ago that Dale Watson runs that was an old bar in the 50s here. And as soon as I walk in the door, who's playing but Barbara Pittman the same day. It was very, this, there's a, a weirdness that surrounds this space that I've always been a skeptic about that sort of thing. I, I come from a preacher's kid background and I left that. So I don't believe in that stuff anymore. And I started working here and there is just a weird little magic that you can, I, I compare it sometimes to a radio frequency. When someone comes in and they get on that wavelength, the room kind of starts to work with them which sounds crazy to say, but when you are in here night and day and you really see how people kind of come into the space and some people get, uh, they're just too in awe and they forget this is your garage tonight. This isn't, these faces on the wall are what was yesterday, it's your time now. And then other times people come in and they just immediately, you can feel that, that the juju of the place just grabs them. So it's a, a very incredible space. Another thing too, like Ike Turner, he was a talent scout for Sam. That's right. So like he brought in a lot of the incredible artists that came in here and recorded. And a lot of people don't realize that. Without That's why B.B. King came here. Yeah, yeah. Like without without Ike, there wouldn't have been a B.B. King to come through here initially. So that's all. Also important too, I, he had his own issues. But. Bibi actually came in because of the Bahari brothers who were producing him. And he was recording at several different studios. This was a stop on his, he also recorded in, I believe, a gymnasium here in Memphis, or that might've been Ike Turner. But he was coming in with the Bahari brothers who were producing him. So originally Sam's kind of a studio for hire and anybody can come in and record. And he, he makes a connection with Leonard Chess. And that's how he starts sending a lot of these blues artists that he's recording up to Chess Records in Chicago. Dewey wore out his welcome at the radio station in 1958 when they transitioned to a more straight-laced format. He spent the rest of his life bouncing around smaller radio stations, trying to recapture the magic of the 50s. Regardless of where he ended up, the veteran who struggled with substance abuse was a link in a long chain of social change dating back to the Civil War. What's interesting about that, too, is to your point, that almost dates back to Civil War Reconstruction era. Memphis was one of the first towns that the Union took in the Civil War. And so for a period of time outside of the rest of kind of this part of the country, here was a town where black people were being afforded way more freedoms than they had been given from the moment they were brought into America. And it created a sort of place where white and black people dating almost back to that time, we're now working alongside each other instead of black people working for in, as, in, as slaves for, for white people. So it always created something in Memphis where once you put people next to each other like that, what we often find is, oh, we're the same. It takes such a level of ignorance to miss that. And that sort of ignorance propagates when we're keeping ourselves away from each other or when white supremacy is, mm -hmm. is doing that. I just think it's really important because Memphis used music and art as honestly in a way as a tool and a way to tell their own experience and story but as a tool ultimately to push these ideas through culture so that mm -hmm. they could eventually pass through policy and that's something that is very important for us to remember like these people weren't just doing this because they love to make art right. these people were doing this because it was life or death inside of all of that ugliness there is a thread and a theme of togetherness that i feel like always ultimately rises to the top you know what a john right now good peter passports red on blues brought you through the curse the best meat products in my good old starling starling darling always remember by good old Starling, because they're the finest of them all. Okay, it's all right. Right now, it's old Phillips bringing your red hot blue coming through WHBQ and Hotel Tisca on the magazine floor. Right, Maybelline floor. Oh, that's right, they changed the name. Maybelline floor right in good old Memphis, Tennessee. Don't forget we got all these good records on it. Pompa Tune to 306 Poplar, 50 South Main. Right now, the whole next portion of red hot blues coming through the curse of People's Furniture Company down at 310 South Main. We always welcome to buy, yes, sir, nothing but the best. This lady down there we call Grandma's been driving me crazy. I said, I wish you'd get a picture of Elvis and get his autograph on it.